and welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special episode of the High Low Sports Podcast. Because it's not just me and DJ talking to you today, we are joined by a very special guest, a soon-to-be five-time Paralympic competitor, and a multiple medal-winning competitor, including two gold medals in his time uh, in swimming, and that is Matt Levy joining us from Australia. He is an Australian swimmer getting ready for his fifth Paralympic Games. Matt, welcome in. Obviously, this is a a, a, a getting ready training time for you. You're kind of winding down your training, getting ready to compete. How do you feel so far? Yeah, yeah thanks so much for having me on the uh, the podcast. Um, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, we had our nationals uh, back in uh, well, about five or so weeks ago now, and um, <clears throat> it was a really stressful period of time. And it was good to get, I guess, get that out of the way and to get uh, um, <clears throat> on the team and to, uh, I guess, get those qualifying times and and all that and um yeah now it's just, i guess getting into the fine tuning of um the preparation for the games and uh we're going into a pretty unknown environment with with covid and and all, and all the protocols that it that it brings but um yeah it's really exciting to um be going to my fifth, fifth games and to uh see what i can produce and see what i can do yeah awesome i mean uh, you think about this five games is unheard of in a lot of different sports to go to a uh, your fifth consecutive. I mean, because these are just like every other event, four years in separation, right? And so you've been going yeah. at this for quite a long time, it feels like. Yeah, yeah. So while, um, oh yeah, obviously it's my fifth, fifth games that you don't really think about it as one games after the next. It's really, um, for me, I guess I enjoy what I'm doing. I have a passion for what I do. So I, just, I love to, I guess, see myself continually improve and continually uh, get better. And I guess that's kind of why I continually do what I do, it's not so much just to tick off another game and to tick off another uh, medal or result. Um, it's really about, for me, seeing, I guess, that I still have improvement in me at 34, uh, which is not not old, um, but I guess in sporting terms, it's not young. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's um, really been an exciting journey and a journey that I would never regret if I had to do it over again. Yeah, I know. that's it, it is really exciting. I'm looking at, you know, looking at your your medals count and, and you actually had your best games in 2012, but you didn't just like shy away after that. You know, you kept, you kept driving through, you actually have more medals after those games than you did before those games. So, uh, you know, that is, you talk about your peak, obviously being 34, I'm 30, I'm 30 as well. So we're, you know, in those 30 ranges. And if you can compete at an, at, at an, at an athletic event, especially a world-class event, like what you're doing and still fight for, these medals, I mean, you just won bronze in 2019. I mean, you still obviously have it. And, um, you know, it's super exciting to see that you will be going to your fifth games. And you mentioned COVID. Obviously, I was going to say you're, you're kind of an old hat at this by now, getting ready for your fifth games. But with the COVID situation coming <laughs> forward, how has that changed these last preparation months for you? Um, yeah, it's been very difficult. Um, obviously, most countries have had lockdowns. And we had a, a, a big lockdown in March, April um or march april and march april may and uh yeah it was i guess difficult to not be able to swim um and do the sport i guess you love at that time and um yeah it was, it's been a really big adjustment and you kind of really have to know where you're going and, and what you're doing and why you're going to be there because um uh, you know in australia um they tend to lock down um pacific st pacific states um if there's COVID cases so um it's uh yeah it's been very tricky to um, head to competitions and and work out if you're going to go back to your training program or or not, or you're going to stay on. Or it's yeah, it's been a myriad of different uh, scenarios at play. And um, yeah, heading into the games uh, when we get to Tokyo, will be even more of a challenge um, with COVID testing most days and um, a lot of COVID protocol around uh, competition and and training and even sleeping and eating as well. Yeah, I could uh, I could only imagine. I mean. I will, ha I will say this, though. Uh, you guys have definitely handled it better than we have over here in the States. Uh, obviously, you know, whether we want to close or not, it seems to be open to each individual state. And with there being so many, it's uh, nobody's on the same page, it uh, mm -hmm. feels like. Or at least you guys have, have a sort of direction you're going towards, right? And it's, it seems well, to be... <laughs> yeah, yes and no. Like, I think uh, same thing, like, in Australia, I think everything, everyone's on different pages with whether they're going to lock down or not lock down. Um, whether they lock down for one case or lock down for 10 cases and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's pretty much on the same page with that. But um, I think being an island, I guess it definitely does help um, with kind of trying to uh, keep out uh, much of the, the issues that, that I guess mainland countries would have. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. A little luxury there in that one, if you will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so obviously we've talked about a little bit, you know, your, your, how you, you know, your, your success with swimming, but how did you, let's, let's flash back to the beginning. Obviously you have a very interesting, I like, I, I, you know, reading your story is absolutely fantastic. You've actually published a book on it and we'll talk about that a little later, but really, how did you get into swimming? Obviously um, you were diagnosed with cerebral palsy and vision disparity, uh, vision impairment from being born premature how how have you gone and dealt with those situations sorry like like just talk about through your from the start to now how kind of how you've traveled this journey yeah so i was was born pretty early born born at 25 weeks um back in 1987 uh i um i guess as a consequence of being born early uh i had a a bleed on the brain the first probably 10 or so days of life which i guess caused a lot of a lot of issues and uh, I've, um, uh, as a consequence from that, um, I became vision impaired or legally blind. Um, so I can see about mm, two, two, three meters centrally and have no peripheral. Um, so I guess it's like looking into a tunnel essentially. Uh, and yeah, I was diagnosed with, uh, cerebral palsy, which is a neurological condition, um, quite early on, which, um, for me, I guess it affects, uh, my, uh, how, the, how the messages come from my brain to my muscles. And, uh, for me, I guess it, it's a lot easier to swim than it is to walk. Um, and uh, I guess early on my speech was slurred and I had a little trouble speaking and that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, I guess from probably day dot to around 15, I have had around 45 operations and still continue to have uh, a myriad of operations uh, today. But um, I guess I started swimming mainly for health reasons. Uh, to really kind of help me move my arms and legs and to get me kind of healthy and moving um because uh being in the water was a lot easier than being on land and uh i guess it really started as therapy for for me and a therapy for uh me as a person um rather than me competing uh and yeah i guess i've had some challenges along the way uh but uh i guess it's really about making the most of the opportunities that you have and we all have i guess the same 24 hours in a day uh the same amount of time to do things in in our, in our lives and just about i guess taking the opportunities that we get to really make the most of what we can do uh with our lives and uh, for me i guess i've tried to do that throughout uh throughout my life um whether i've succeeded failed or or somewhere in between yeah when did you when did that moment hit you like obviously you talk about doing it for you know more therapy more you know mental and and physical therapy for your body just to kind of keep you moving but when did it hit you that like swimming could be something you do competitively like when did that that bug kind of come come and get you yeah so i saw um i went to sydney 2000 paralympics and olympic games and i guess i saw a lot of people at the paralympic games that year uh, i was 12 13 years of age and uh, i saw people with far worse disabilities than myself and um that kind of really started to like the competitive fire in me and that some and that kind of got me thinking that uh it was really something that i probably could do more than just swimming up and down uh laps of a swimming pool and um that's i guess where that fire started to be lighted and and um yeah it kind of just went from there i got um i I trained a little bit more and and i guess started with having a goal of wanting to make paralympic games and that kind of really changed the mindset and changed the shift um to just swimming up and down to really kind of training for something and training for something uh, worthwhile. And yeah, uh, here we are um, some 21 years later. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, really, it, at, like for the sports world, I feel like it's worth mentioning. You didn't just do it to just, you know, because you were competitive. You did it and you did it well uh, immediately. I mean, it, it correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 2003, you broke the record for the 200 meter freestyle short course. Yeah. So that was like probably my first world record um, that I broke um, in, in 03. And um, yeah, that kind of really started me on kind of the rise to, um, doing something half decent, um, on the world <laughs> stage and, uh, yeah, it just kind of went, went from there and, uh, yeah, I'm still trying to kind of work out what events I like and what events I can swim, um, <laughs> at, at my age, I, I think I've done a myriad of different events, uh, over my career, uh, started off as a 400 meter freestyle swimmer, which is, um, eight laps of the pool. Um, okay. and, uh, yeah, in my career I've done. 50 freestyle, which is one lap of the pool. And, uh, I've done hundred meters, which is, 
which is is two laps, and I've done IM, which is uh, four laps of each, uh, two one lap of each stroke, um, four laps in total, and um, yeah, I've done anything from distance to sprint events. So uh, yeah, I've definitely done my fair share of different events, and yeah, it's just really working out what how I best I fit. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, and and you know, uh, one of the one of the cool things I think I, I found when I was you know reading up on the Paralympic swimming uh classifications and things is obviously they classify individuals by their abilities um, by what they're capable of being able to do uh but you're classified in the s7 group which is people who are you know very similar into what you know you guys are capable of physically you know due, due to your uh cp and and things like that and how does that change things for you because like you know you talk about if you were compared to the olympics the olympics is just everybody runs a 100 meter dash everybody swims 100 meter free but for Paralympic to be competing against individuals with the same abilities as you, is that does that even drive that fire even a little bit more that you, you want to not only be in your classification the best time, but even all the classifications you want to have the best time? Is that does that ever go through your mind? Maybe. Um, it would be nice, but yeah, not really. Um, because um, I guess I'm an S seven class, which is, I guess, mild to moderate disability, and then um, we go all the way up to. In the physical classification, we go all the way up to 10. Um, so I guess there's three classes between myself and the top class in the physical classification, which uh, there's about maybe, you know, in 50 meters, there's about five second difference um, between the winner of my class and the winner of the, the, the highest class. So um, I guess it's really always about trying to um, beat your own time and to better your own self because uh, at the end of the day, you don't know who's going to turn up and how they're going to turn up. And uh, the, being a classification system, um, you're always going to have people at the top end and the bottom end, um, both physically and obviously performance wise. And um, yeah, it's very, very hard to um, <clears throat> have a system that's ever fair. Um, because yeah, you've always got about 100 points between each, each or 20 points or something between each, each class classification. So um, uh, in yeah, it's always trying to get the most, most fair system, but it's um yeah very difficult with um the way uh, classification works and and you're grading people on their said conditions and that kind of thing. Um, but um, unless you have someone with exactly the same disability, um, exactly the same impairment, um, it's very hard to I guess uh, determine who. Uh, yeah, where they, I guess they, they fit, but um, I guess to make it fair, they, they, I guess, design the classification system and kind of fit people in classes that they feel that um, their, their impairment uh, it fits in. And yeah, it's, it's very, very complicated. Um, it's, um, yeah. I guess the fairest it can be, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's um, always been a, a bane of controversy uh, in sport just because the way it's set up and the way, I guess, uh, the the system system is and and in swimming and, and other sports are pretty similar uh most everyone i guess runs on the classification system um but yeah it's 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 always been up for debate and whether it works or whether it doesn't work but i guess it's the fairest it can be and um yeah whatever system you have is always going to be uh questioned and 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 um scrutinized and yeah like you said that the olympics obviously everyone just rocks up and competes and there's no system in place but i guess people can still take drugs and that kind of stuff so uh it's yeah the classification system is is um pretty similar to that and then, like yeah we all just rock up and compete but um there is people that can uh, not take drugs but uh, can tank the system and um and uh benefit it to their their own own needs in terms of what class they're in and that kind of thing um so there is yeah, potentially that at play um, more so than drugs in in an Olympic sport. <laughs> yeah, and and no, that's a good point though. I mean, it is a uh, I guess you get murky waters when it gets into these differentiating between some of the classifications. Um, as you mentioned, I mean, there is yeah, you know, it, they they try to clear it up as much as possible. And you are exactly right though; there are very 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 big complications in it because I was trying to read through it and and grasp it since since we talked about doing this interview and. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty smart guy. I mean, but there's uh, reading it. I honestly felt really dumb reading it. And, like I, <laughs> I was like, there were just things that they would put into it that I'm like, wait, really? That's a separation between 
a class. Like it was just very unique um, around yeah. some of the classifications. Yeah, I mean, they originally wish uh, they just recently changed the system in 2018, and so every, that made made everyone have to get classified again. Um, so the whole world before Tokyo this year had to get looked at, had to get assessed, and assessed in the new system. Um, so that I guess threw up even more challenges because um, uh, the new system was was different, and people that were some people that were in the old system as a certain class some of them were classed out and not not eligible in the in the new system where it were um uh and they had competed at like the last three or four four games and won medals and that kind of thing so uh yeah. it's um yeah it hasn't been the the classification system hasn't been uh the well most well received thing in paralympic sport but it's the thing that i guess holds it together otherwise you wouldn't have the sport that we have today <laughs> yeah no that's a, that's a good point and, and, you know, just like any sport, you mentioned it, uh, classification seems to always be, no matter what you have in in place, it always seems to be the most critiqued thing. And, uh, you know, I think of just different sports that they've had those issues with. And we look at soccer and their, what they just went through this last, or football and, uh, you know, uh, the rest of the world, what they went through in this last year about the, uh, the Super Leagues and uh, oh, yeah. not, not being not being happy enough with a, with a Champions League. They won a Super League. Um, so classification always being a thing that, that can become a part mm -hmm. of it. Uh, but talking more about like obviously with we, we talk about Olympic athletes, especially over here in the US, that like the Olympic athletes here, just even regular Olympic athletes, they have to go and work a regular day job, you know, nine to five, if you will. Uh and correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually have a master's in BA in business administration that you just received as well, correct? Yeah, so I um I received that uh end of last year. Um yeah, so that's pretty pretty cool. I thought I kind of needed something a bit more uh tangible and um i guess recognized and and just a bachelor of business and um i saw that the mba that i did it was, had a pretty big practical component in it and it really kind of taught uh um skills that you would need in the workplace um we did a few uh i guess mini internships of, of 12 weeks um um three three separate internships over the course of the year and a half i did my um my MBA and um, that was, I guess that kind of really sold me on the MBA that I did and um, how practical it was to really kind of get that uh, real world understanding. Um, I've been working in the corporate world for about 11, 12 years now, but um, to really kind of get that uh, in-depth understanding um, was really good. And um, uh, yeah, MBA, uh, MBA is never, I guess, go out of fashion. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, so it um, was really good to, I guess, get that um kicked off um and I, now i just need to kind of embed those skills into the learnings i guess that i've got from that mba into i guess the working life and kind of see where that kind of lands yeah how is that uh how does that work i mean with training wise are you still <laughs> are you still working or are you working remote or are you just uh do they let you have off for training or like is it a sabbatical how does that how does that work for you is like uh when you tell them like hey i'm going to compete in my fifth paralympic games do they like all right, we'll leave you like we'll leave you on 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 payroll, but like you have to do a couple work or how how does that work for you? Um, so I've been working uh, so since COVID, I've been working remote, and most people in Australia have been working remote. Um, so that kind of definitely does help from a training perspective. And um, I live in at the moment in Canberra um, at the Australian Institute of Sport, um, which is our national training center. Uh, so um, everything's on site, uh, training's on site, live is, live is on living facilities is on site. Um, so that makes it really easy um, compared to when I was in Sydney, Australia, uh, uh, to travel to work, um, travel to training, all that kind of stuff. I was spending around 15 or 16 hours of travel time um, prior to COVID. So COVID's definitely been a help in terms of uh, simplifying my my life a little bit. Um, since I've moved to, to the Australian Institute of Sport, but um, yeah, from a work perspective, uh, I, I just take off I guess when I have camps and when I have um, <clears throat> major meets and um, I'll be taking off probably a week or two off before the Paralympic Games, so around probably four weeks uh, in total. Uh, and yeah, other than that, I work my work around training and my training around work um, to kind of fit uh, fit my day, basically. And um, yeah, work have been really good. Um, I guess I've been really upfront with them from the beginning um, since I started back in 2010. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just, um, really about being open and honest with, 
your manager and kind of getting them on board because um yeah not everyone understands sport but they do understand I guess life and and life balance and that kind of stuff so um yeah it's just a matter of I guess uh yeah having that conversation I guess and, and being open yeah. um and transparent <clears throat> yeah that's it's always interesting to talk about the uh that you just said work-life balance um for athletes especially for somebody of your caliber of an athlete. I mean, when you talk about doing Paralympic games, not everybody gets to do that, right? Obviously not everybody gets to go and compete on a world stage. Um, and so to do so while still working your job and, and your, your job understanding enough to be like, all right, yeah, we'll let you have a couple weeks here and there, a couple weeks there. We will let, you know, we'll watch and support you as you go off and represent Australia for, uh, you know, the, the Paralympics. It's really cool. It's, it's really interesting to hear as well. I mean, cause there are some, I, you know, I, see it with the Olympic trials here in the U S some, some people will be working at a sporting goods store, go to the Olympic trials, never have a job, uh, kept for them, you know? And so their, their employer doesn't respect them as much as like, you know, on the backside of things. So it's, it's really cool to see that they actually do give you that opportunity. Um, now I do like looking at literally looking at your career so far swimming, it's, it's fascinating to me because you haven't just done well. You, you talked about, you know, doing a, a so-so job when you first said it, you're very, very humble about, your success here. I mean, but you look at your, the, the events you finished in, you talk about doing different ones. You've, I believe you've meddled in every different stroke that I can see freestyle medley breaststroke. Uh, at least every stroke is represented in some way, shape or form, whether it be through medley or through an individual. How does that feel just to know that no matter really the event, you don't feel too out of place, if you will. <laughs> um yeah I kind of never thought about it like that but it's yeah it's really about um yeah once I work out what events I want to do uh it's really about I guess trying to get the skills um and the understanding of that event um to really kind of swim the fastest I can swim um and possibly uh yeah uh try and kind of improve those those skills uh in the process but uh yeah, I guess I've kind of covered most most strokes, um, except backstroke um, from a medal perspective. Uh, but um, I, I guess I covered that in the relay. Uh, but um, yeah, it's been definitely a, a, a wild ride and something that I guess if I look back on my career um, from the at the very beginning uh, in 2000, when I saw the Paralympic Games for the first time, uh, I never, I guess, would have dreamt that I would be going to my fifth games, uh, some 21 years later and and obviously covering covering a few events along the way and along the journey and uh many different countries uh in between yeah i was just looking at your world champions world championships it looks like 13 medals in your world championship tour as well and that's in above itself along with your seven paralympic games i mean you talk about doing it all over the world all over the country you've been to you've won it looks like i feel like you've won an event in every continent at this point uh, other than other than Antarctica, if looking if, if I'm looking at this correctly, I do feel like that is that is correct. Uh, I, I guess it depends on what you consider Oceania versus what you consider the uh, the Asian continent. I guess is the difference. But um, yeah, no, that's it's absolutely awesome to watch. What is your favorite one though? What is your favorite stroke to to swim? Um, I think it's always been freestyle. Uh, I guess it's always been the most competitive uh, discipline, but um, it gives you, I guess, a uh, chance to swim relays. It gives you a chance to, I guess. Um, being like a team, I guess, environment um, in an individual sport. And um, yeah, I've always enjoyed, I've always been more of a natural freestyler. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, um, I guess, always a, always good to kind of mix up the strokes and to really kind of branch out a little bit because, um, yeah, doing uh, overarm the whole time um, becomes very repetitive and boring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can imagine, uh, especially... Now, do you uh, do you ever feel like do you feel like that is your best event too, or is it just kind of that's just the favorite one because it's the most natural for you, or is that do you do you feel like it is your best? Uh no, I guess it's been not my best historically. Um, it's probably been one of my worst. Uh, well, huh. in certain certain events, it's fit, certain comps, it's been probably my best. But I guess overall, I think it's been medium range. But I'm I think. Because I feel natural, more natural at that stroke, um, uh, I, it feels the easiest to do. But I guess being freestyle, everyone can do it, uh, and it um, becomes a lot more competitive. Um, I guess I've won medals in hundred freestyle at multiple games uh, and in relays and stuff. But I think my most 
probably successful games, successful disciplines probably been I am probably, um, okay. which is um, 50 meters of each stroke. But uh, yeah, definitely it's always been freestyle in terms of my natural feel and, and how I feel best um, in that, uh, in, in a certain stroke. Yeah. Do you ever feel like that's, that's kind of a, a weird thing to talk about? Cause you talked about like really outside of backstroke, you haven't really, you know, you, I, 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 do you, do you compete individually backstroke? Because it, what I was looking at, I hadn't seen you compete individually backstroke. No, no. Um, I don't compete individually in backstroke. Um, maybe sometimes here and there to get a bit of practice, but, um, yeah, mostly it's, um, all the other strokes, I guess you mentioned. Yeah. So, so does that, does that feel weird that like your best event is the one that contains an event you don't even a discipline you don't really compete in individually too is that does that feel a little weird when you when you think about it like yeah i'm like you're good enough that you don't even compete in this one individually but you're still good enough to win that event that includes that that single discipline <laughs> um i guess it makes it hard because uh being uh i guess yeah the backstroke in the i am um but uh, i guess i have to try a lot harder to keep up with, I guess, those natural backstrokers and the ones that can actually do it really, really well. So, um, yeah, it makes it tricky um, from that sense. And I guess you have to uh, be better at some of the other disciplines in that in that race to be able to um, to uh, get on top of, of them because um, I guess they're going to be a lot better in that stroke than, than I am. So, yeah, it's a catch-22. Like, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, great to, I guess, be in the mix and win medals, um, even though my backstroke is not that great. But you have to try a lot harder in those other other uh, other disciplines. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you ever feel like it's a more of a mind over matter thing? Like, I mean, do you feel like maybe it's more because your your mentality is like, yeah, you have to focus more, but maybe that makes it better. Is that? Do you feel like that might be the case, or like, do you think like the, the mentality of it plays plays into why you're better maybe at IM than freestyle straight up? Um. Yeah, I might put more probably pressure on myself in freestyle because. Um, you know, like people are going to be a lot closer. Uh, I guess that yeah would definitely probably be have a be a factor in it because um, yeah, like you, I tend to be a bit more relaxed in the IM because uh, you need to be because you're doing four four other strokes um, rather than one. And um, yeah, it's definitely the way you how you approach things that really help. Um, whether you're going to uh, be stressed out or not stressed out or um, be more relaxed or not relaxed and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, definitely. Uh, your mindset and your approach to things, um, whether it's in my sport or in my life, it's definitely helps um, to be, uh, to approach things um, in different lights sometimes and not get too uptight. Cause um, yeah, like we can't control what we our competitors are doing, but we can control, I guess, what we do. So I, I try and approach um, that kind of same process in, in, in my races and, uh, it's, yeah, it's very hard, I guess, in the heat of the moment, but, um, you try best to kind of, uh, have a calm mind and have a calm focus to get the best outcome. Yeah. You know, I know there's, I, there's thousands of coaches out there just kind of laughing at us when we, when we talk about that, right. If they hear this, they're gonna be like, what we tell you guys to calm down every single time to not think about it before the, you know, before the event. And I feel like you hit, you hit the nail on the head. It's so much easier to say that than to actually, to actually do that for sure. Um, yeah. Now, one of the, part, the reason I ask about some of the mentality is because you did, as we talked about earlier, you did just release a memoir back in 2020, uh, well, not that long ago. I say back in 2020, like it was, uh, but you know, last year. And the title of it is actually "Keeping Your Head Above Water: Inspirational Insights from a Champion." So, when you were creating this memoir, what, like, what was the goal when you first set out to talk about this? With you know, talk about your book. Like, what was what was your goal to to get across? Uh, I guess originally when I first started, it was really about um, improving my public speaking and kind of getting my brand out there. But then as I kind of did it, uh, as I kind of like went through the process of creating uh, the concept and creating, I guess, uh, the stories in between, um, it really became more about um, sharing my journey and sharing my experiences of what I've done and hope that I can kind of pass on lessons to whoever's reading it and uh, I guess give them some tips that they can kind of uh, bring into their own lives, whether it's sport, whether it's personal, whether it's uh, anything in life. Um, uh, the concepts, I guess, that I kind of talk about are universal um, and something that I guess you can all 
everyone can relate to and everyone can kind of piece together in their own lives, whether it's whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, I guess at the end of the day, it's really about sharing my own thoughts and my own journey, but also, I guess, leaving the reader with um, some tips and tricks that can potentially help them in their own own lives and and um, their own, I guess, path that they're going on. Awesome. Yeah. See, I, I love that because, you know, I, I, I mean, I feel like this is a situation where you've taken something that a lot of people would look at potentially as a disability, right? And yes. as, as detrimental to their, their health. I mean, we have very able-bodied people that don't even try to compete enough uh, to complete enough to, to compare with what you've gone through in your, your personal journey. And, and to show that your diagnosed disability is not a disability. In fact, it's actually something that you turn into an advantage and, and we're able to capitalize on in, in, a, in a different way is, is amazing. I mean, uh, when you, when you talk about cerebral palsy, it, it, it can affect you in so many different ways, right? It's not just yeah, one different. Definitely. <laughs> so like, so for you, I mean, how is that like, really like I, you did mention a little bit earlier, like obviously it, it does affect some of the way that the nerves happen, but, but on a personal basis, how has CP really made things different for you that, that people might not understand? Yeah. So I think for me, um, cerebral palsy, uh, is really, um, I have weakness, I guess, on my, on my legs. Um, so I guess I don't get, uh, as much, um, I guess I kind of walk, struggle to walk, um, sometimes. And, uh, I definitely can't walk in a straight line. Uh, and I guess going up and down stairs is very, very difficult, uh, from a, from a cerebral palsy, um, perspective and a balanced perspective. Uh, and um, yeah, definitely depth perception um, is very difficult, um, mainly from, I guess, a vision perspective, but um, not being able to, I guess, feel my feet and having that, I guess, nerve and tactile sensation um, is very difficult. Uh, and uh, yeah, every now and again, I guess I could have a bit of slurred, slurred speech. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess just not having the same motor patterns as, as a normal, uh, as a non-able, non-able, non-disabled person uh, is, um, yeah, difficult. Um, I guess it's, yeah, it's definitely hard to comprehend, but um, I guess it's more about the feeling and, and um, the understanding of that different feeling that, that I kind of have that, that um, I guess other people probably won't understand. And uh, yeah, I guess from, from my perspective, I guess in summary, yeah, it, it, it affects me in, in different ways. And um, yeah, it may not be, visible um, as such, but um, yeah, it definitely, I guess, affects me from a physical perspective uh, and a comp and a cognitive perspective as well. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the cognitive perspective. I mean, mentally wise mentality, uh, your, men your mentality to get, uh, to get through an everyday basis is, is a big deal of this, right? I mean, you, there's no, I, I almost feel like there's no feeling sorry for yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, you kind of have to force yourself to, to, to get through it at some points. Is that, is that about how it goes? Uh, yeah, I think it's really about finding the positives in, in the negative. And I think even if you don't want to get out of bed one morning, even if you don't want to, uh, do something, um, or, or, or do that particular activity, it's really about, I guess, finding that one positive in that activity to really kind of get yourself motivated. Cause I think if you don't try um to do something if you don't i guess try to make that effort um you're not i guess continuing to grow and continuing to learn it's um yeah it's for me i guess if i don't want to go to training i'm not going to get, get the benefit of, of of that training but um it's yeah really about finding that one or two positive things uh in that session that i can do right um even if i'm doing a bad even if i'm having a bad day i need to, i want to come out of that session with something whether it's a one positive thing um, to really kind of help me and improve what I do today um, to be better tomorrow. And I think that's the same with anything we do. It's uh, whether we want to do it or not. Um, it's really about, I guess, finding that one positive out of what we do to really make the most out of uh, the journey and the journey, what we the journey of what we're going on. And um, yeah, if we can improve one thing today, um, it will lead to two things tomorrow and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, it's just really a continual process. That's a perfect way to put it. Improve one thing today, 
and it's a snowball process after that, right? Everything is, yeah. they, they like to say downhill, but it's a staircase. You're stacking on top of each other one stair at a time. Um, yeah, and that's it's, a fantastic. It could be windy, process. but it's, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's worth it. It'll get there eventually, right? That's the goal, right? You'll get there eventually. And, um, but so I kind of want to, I, I want to ask you some, on, on a personal level for you, what has been your proudest moment along your journey so far? Like, what is that one moment that you stand out on? And it could be today, it could be three years, six years, eight years down, you know, 20 years in the future. And you look back on and you are just the absolutely most ecstatic about that moment. What is that one moment that sticks out to you the most? Uh, I guess just my whole career, really, like to be able to uh, mentor the young ones coming through and kind of show them what uh, what it means to be successful. It's not just, I guess, that gold medal. It's not that, it's not just that personal best it's it's the the whole journey it's the whole experience that you draw on throughout your career and uh I guess if I could leave my the legacy of my sport and my journey as one thing it would be um that yeah no matter I guess what's uh what you've done what you've achieved it's really about I guess what you can learn from um the experience and uh for me, I guess it's yeah, the proudest moment would be to kind of continue to share that message to the younger generation um, of Paralympians, of people that I kind of meet in my daily life. But uh, I guess from a personal note, um, winning the uh, being awarded the Order of Australia Medal in 2014 would be one of the proudest moments. It's um, was it signifies services to sport uh, in Australia and uh, it's internationally recognized and I think that would be one of my proudest uh achievements but um but yeah it's not not I guess thanks to my results and anything like that it's all thanks to I guess the uh, more so the people that I guess have been on that journey with me and uh, I definitely couldn't do it without the people that I bring along the way and the um supporters and that my family and all that kind of thing uh, as well and uh I guess at the end of the day as as athletes that everyone sees that top of the tree the, and the, us uh, competing and and winning medals and or, or, or failing or, or succeeding but at the end of the day it's um thanks to the people that we have around us that are able to get us to that point and um yeah and the public don't see that at the end of the day but um yeah it's uh that's i guess one of my proudest moments as well to be able to uh compete for my country and compete on the world stage, but to do it for my friends, my family and the people that support me as well. Yeah. Does it ever feel surreal? Uh, all yeah. the people that yeah. support you, do you ever just get that moment where you're like, you know, like this is crazy. I never would have thought we got here. And then here you are. Uh, does it, do you get that? Uh, maybe when I've finished and stopped swimming and kind of thought about it, but yeah, at the moment it's just, continuing to continue on kind of thing so uh yeah it's um it's still still in the dream i think <laughs> i feel you no that, that is that's not a bad thing by any means i mean obviously it's it is something to look look back on one day and um now i do want to ask there because on the flip side of all the all the best moments we all have that moment where we probably question whether we we're on the right path for you did you have have you had that moment in your career did you ever stop and be like do i really feel like continuing to do this and if you, if so what did you do to overcome that um I guess I had that kind of moment most days um I guess I don't want to go to training some days I, I don't want to uh go to work I don't want to do this I don't want to have this meeting with my boss and that kind of thing and um I guess I kind of in all those kind of moments I kind of think to myself and reassess I guess what I'm doing and, and whether I want to continue on this path and um yeah, it's just really about, I guess, remembering why I started in the first place and why I wanted to do that particular thing in the first place. And um, I guess the only way I'm going to get the best out of it is by giving my all to that particular activity. And uh, I guess there's not been, there's been many moments where I've had doubts and had I've second guessed myself, but I always remember back to the reason why I set out to do that goal in the first place, because I'm um, I guess I always set goals that are uh, in the future and um, it's always, I guess, trying to reaffirm those goals and to really kind of understand well, why I want to do it at the very beginning and 
uh, once I've kind of done that, it makes, I guess, those uh, doubts and those questions that I have in my mind uh, a lot a lot easier. And um, <clears throat> I guess during COVID was difficult because um, uh, everyone was in lockdown. We were not able to train for three months, but uh, I guess in that kind of moment, it was continuing to remember why I wanted to make Tokyo and, and whether I still want to make Tokyo. And once I kind of came up with that decision that, yeah, I still wanted to continue this um, journey because uh, another year down the track, uh, you're another year older. And um, I was 33 last year and being 34 is um, uh, 12 months down the track, which um, being at the uh, older end of the athlete spectrum, it makes it very difficult. So um, I guess that was probably the only moment that I kind of, questions with myself for maybe half a second um mm -hmm. but um i guess if you still have the passion you still have the desire to do something um there's no need to i guess question yourself it's just a matter of finding a way yeah no and that's it. you you've you've gotten there you've you are now going to your fifth olympics um and now you did mention you meet you, you set a lot of goals uh right for the future what is your number one goal once you get to tokyo and you're competing what is your number one at the end of the day uh, I guess just to enjoy myself, um, stay healthy, uh, and get out of there healthy. Uh, and yeah, just have some fun and, and show, show the world what I can do. Um, cause, um, yeah, I guess we're there to compete with the race. Um, and yeah, all the hard work's being done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, the hardest part, I feel like the hardest part about competitions are everything leading up to the competition, never the yeah, actual competition day, <laughs> right? You just kind of put your head down and go. Uh, and your swimming events, they have swimming events scheduled from August 25th all the way through until the 3rd of September. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, the gold medal events will actually be daily based off of each individual um, event competition. So do you know which days you're racing on yet or are they kind of out in the up up in the air so far? Yeah, I guess I'm, I think I'm racing day three, five and seven. Um, okay, so that. So we're going to be on Thursday the 26th and then Saturday the 28th and then the 7th would be, yeah, Tuesday the 31st. So we'll, we'll have you in the end of August for you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm racing um, day three is 100 breaststroke. Uh, day five is 4 by 100 freestyle relay, 34 point. Um, and the day seven is 50 freestyle um, S7 uh, event. So, um, yeah, I've got a pretty... A good program um not as busy as i usually am but um but yeah hopefully can win some medals and do some pbs and most of all have fun yeah absolutely now for any of our younger listeners out there i i do want to ask you have gone through a myriad of things to get to where you're at what was what is the one thing you want to leave anybody with who's out there struggling or trying to make it over make it over that hump or dealing with their own personal demons or issues what what is the one thing you want to you want to tell them that I obviously not to get them through it, but to help them if they, if you can. Yeah. So I guess, um, I've gone through, I guess, many challenges and many issues in, in my life. And, um, I always try and think of the positives in the negatives. And, um, it's really about, I guess, uh, understanding that, yeah, you're in, going into a bad, you're in a bad situation at the moment, but, um, it always can be worse. Um, and I guess there's always light at the end of the tunnel. It's just really, continuing to focus on the positives and continuing to put one foot in front of the other and to really kind of uh, make the most of each day and to really kind of uh, keep positive um, in, in that negative uh, moment. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's using, I guess, those people around you to uh, lean on and to lean on for support. Um, and, and yeah, it's just really about, uh continuing to remain positive um in in, in that situation because um yeah it's a difficult time but um you'll be better um off afterwards um if you i guess just remain positive and uh remain um remain calm i guess in that situation yeah treat it like an iceberg if you will right you're yeah. you keep your head above water that way your support group will keep you afloat um, that's, that's what we build the support group for. You've talked about it and we've talked about it in the past on the show as well, you know, having that support group. So it helps you get through everything, um, uh, get you through your daily life and every event. So 
absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, Matt, how do, how is everybody going to keep up with you? Uh, what are what's your social media accounts that they that you normally use, and how how's everybody going to follow along with you? Yeah, so um, I've got um, a few social media accounts, but um, and also a website which also has a link to my book. Um, so my my website's uh, www.mattlevyoam.com.au. Uh, and I'm also on uh, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and Instagram at Matt Levy. Um, and uh, yeah, you can uh, follow me on those uh, respective social media uh, sites. Um, but yeah, it's um, been yeah fantastic to chat to you guys um, yeah. on the podcast. And um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be able to share my experience and my journey. Yeah, man, this was absolutely fantastic, Matt. I greatly appreciate it. Obviously, this is. Uh, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your training schedule too. I mean, I'm get, I'm catching you on a early Sunday morning your time. Uh, you know, in between uh, training sessions when we can get you. So, obviously, this is getting down to the nitty gritty for you. But we appreciate you taking the time out, and um, we'll be sure to follow along in your journey as well. We'll uh, add all the links and everything down below on on all the uh, in, in the bios for everything, and uh, we'll make sure we'll even tweet out some results for you too, just because it's going to be absolutely fantastic to follow you along through the events and see how it goes. Um, but Matt, we do want to appreciate you for joining us here on the Highlight Sports. Obviously it was just Kelsey today. DJ is uh, was unavailable to be here for the interview. He's actually working. So uh, those nine to fives get you every once in a while. Uh, but we will be back guys <laughs> next time on some great events. And Matt, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.